I want you to know that I came for that introduction. <laughs> so if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to hear all those events. Uh, that was, the, the, the introduction was great, and the man who gave the introduction was great, so uh, I am very moved. I really am. I want to say something about what he mentioned about that convention. He doesn't know this. Uh, I, uh, it's hard for me to actually talk and not get controversial within two minutes. <laughs> I just realized that. <laughs> so, but please know, I, I don't love controversy. <laughs> it just like happens. <laughs> so I want to make that clear. I don't seek it. Uh, but I, I do want to say, because uh, it's, it's, it's a truth, truths need to be said. And uh, this was a massive credit to uh, the Orthodox Union. I have said, I've talked about that speech. I mean, he didn't, he didn't tell you the, the, the fullness of the courage of, of him and the Orthodox Union to have me their West Coast Convention. I spoke on why I'm not Orthodox. That was the topic you asked me to speak on. Uh, you would never, it, it's, the Mashiach, would have come well before I would get an invitation from Reformed Jews on why I'm not a liberal. <laughs> they would never, ever, 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 ever have a person speak on that subject. They would speak on oh, maybe why they're not reformed, but because that doesn't matter to them. Liberal politics matter. And so it's funny because I, it is funny because he, here I am and, and stating to you that the common conception is erroneous that the right is closed-minded and the left is open-minded. And I'm not, my purpose here is not at all political, but, but truth-telling is more important than any other purpose. But in real life, that's not true. There are closed-minded people on the right and open-minded individuals on the left, but as, as movements, uh, it, it is, there's, there's, no, there's, there's no comparison, and that was a perfect example. And it shows you your security and your willingness to confront ideas that are challenging. So it was, uh, I did not know you were behind that. And if, uh, that alone, Diana, that I, coming to Toronto. So you're very lucky to have me here. What can I tell you? <laughs> You're also lucky to have uh, Dave Gordon. He's, uh, uh, he's, he's a gem. He's, he's a treasure that you have, and I have known him for many years now. And I think so highly, I've actually uh, asked him to do some work for me. I might have paid work because anybody can get anybody to volunteer. But I, 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 I so value him, I actually believe in Kemach in Torah that you pay, you give Kemach for your Torah. And he has done that work, and I hope that it will lead to the fruition of my, uh, among other things, writing a book on men and women. Because if you don't know, I do an hour a week on my national show in America on uh, male-female relations. And uh, it's, uh, there are many people, a woman in my congregation, I couldn't believe this, came over to me last Shabbat and said that my male-female hour saved her marriage. And I, I actually, my, one of my proudest things is that I got a letter from a listener in Brazil said that the male female ever saved her marriage. And I read it on the air. I was very, very touched. So anyway, it's, you can easily hear my show. There's even a Dennis Prager app, which you can put on your smartphone. So it doesn't matter where you live. The technology today is unbelievable. And then, you, can, you know, is Pragertopia, and I'm not giving you ads, I just want you to know what I say is relevant wherever you live, hopefully. So Dave Gordon, uh, thank you for uh, your Shabbat project. To me, this is a sort of I've died and gone to heaven moment. You know, between classical music and Shabbat, <laughs> the only thing missing really is a cigar. And, and I have to say, even that, I have been invited to uh, one of you, I believe, has a cigar place, is that correct? And, and where are you? Don't tell me you left. Yes, good. <laughs> Marty's Shea Tabak, correct? 
So I, every, everything, well not everything, but almost everything a man could want uh, is, uh, is uh, going to be fulfilled here. By the way, can we smoke inside or is that banned in Toronto? No. It's banned in Ontario. So I want to say to the politicians here, that is wrong. <laughs> it is. What the hell is it your business if I choose to smoke with other smokers in a smoking place? You should all clap because, hey, I'll tell you what. You will one day say, one, they came after the cigar smoke. <laughs> but I didn't smoke cigars, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> and you know the rest of this. And I'm dead serious. I am serious. <clears throat> Soon they're going to come after the women who, do, who bottle feed. You will be arrested. <laughs> should have breastfed. Okay, am I being Have I disturbed everybody in some way? I don't even want to, that's the killer, but I know I end up doing it. You, he, this is the toughest talk I have probably ever been invited to give on hope. Why did you do that? Because I can't this, I can't not be honest. I'm, it's not, I'm not capable. It's, I get no credit for, for being honest. I don't have the ability to lie. I take credit for other things. I take credit for courage. I have courage. And that I take credit for. I take no credit for, I can't, I can't lie. It's, it's just, there are people who can't tell the truth. <laughs> there are people who can't lie. So I, I must tell you the greatest story I have to tell you my view on having hope for, the, for mankind's future, okay? This comes, this is one of the, the all-time great moments in thought that I ever experienced. Uh, every young man should have as many wonderful older men in his life as possible. Because young men don't know what it means to be a man without models. Otherwise, young men without older good men become older boys, and worse, animals. We, we, we males, more than females, females need female models, but males need male models. Just the way it is. And uh, I, I was one older man in my life, it was Pinchas Pelly. Not known to many of you, unfortunately, but he's very well known in his day. He's a major Orthodox rabbi and iconoclastic thinker, great, uh, probably the greatest scholar of some of ancient's work, and he wrote his own wonderful work. So I was blessed to know him, and I, and I stayed at his home whenever I visited Israel in Jerusalem. And he, he had a big affection for me, and I felt it. Anyway, we're driving around one day, and I don't know how it happened, he told me this story. The issue of Hope came up. I may have said to him, so Pinchas, do you think there's any hope for peace in the Middle East? I think that might have triggered him. So he said, Dennis, let me tell you a story. In the early days of Israel, it took him at least six months to get a telephone. So I was at the Misrat at the, uh, you know, the Ministry of Communications to take, that would install your phones. And the guy tells me, it's going to take six months. He told me this in Hebrew, but it's one of the rare times it works just as well in English. The, tra other word, the translation is just as effective. So, so when I said to the man, I said, is there any chance, no, excuse me, is there any hope that I can get this phone uh, sooner than six months? And the man says, sir, there is always hope. There's no chance. <laughs> So it, it, it was, uh, it, it, I obviously have never forgotten that line. Whenever people say, so that is, is there any hope? Oh, there's always hope, there's no chance. That's, so that's, now I'm not saying there's no chance, but I want you to understand where I'm coming from. I don't delude myself. Things are really bad. They are. You got a great year. A Jew in, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, in the beginning of the 21st century is very, very lucky. As, by the way, a Jew in Southern California, 
getting in the 21st century. I fully acknowledge that. But things are bad, uh, and, and uh, I do believe that there is hope, and I even do believe there's a chance. But I need to make something uh, quite uh, clear here, that you can't have hope or chance if you aren't clear as to what the problems are. So I have to delineate major problems. And then we can figure out, is there hope with regard to these particular issues? I would also like to uh, say a word about a, a vision that I don't particularly relate to. And that is the notion of, well, you know, uh, Dennis, because I'm, I'm preoccupied with good and evil, and I have been since I was a child. Well, you know, Dennis, in the long run, good always wins. I find that completely unacceptable, not that it's not true, but I find it unappealing and not at all comforting. It doesn't comfort me, because nobody lives in the long run. People live in the now, in the short run. Hitler was defeated. But, well, so what? So what in terms of the six million? Your child is, is thrown into a crematorium, and in the long run, Nazism will die, but in the short run, every child I have is going to be cremated. But we live in the short run. Yes, of course we live, in a certain sense, the eternality of the Jewish people, if you will, the eternality of humankind. Okay. But it, it's, it's, not, it's not that comforting. It has some level, perhaps, of comfort that, that in, the, you know, in the long run, the Hitlers will die out. But the damage that they do while they are strong is, is also infinite. If every human being is of infinite worth, then the, then the suffering is infinitely terrible. You know, the, the Yazidi girls who were gang raped regularly by members of Islamic State, selling them off at 11 to be gang raped. Telling them, you know, in the long run, the Islamic State will probably die out. Okay, but my life is ruined. And there's no undoing that fact. So I don't find it all that comforting in the long run. If, if, and it's also, it, it breeds passivity. If in the long run, good wins, why fight evil? If it's that important, why fight? Right? When anyway, it's like saying if your house is burning down, well, it'll burn down, but in the long run, somebody's going to build a new house here. Oh, that's great. That's great. Oh, then I don't care if my house burns down. So I, I, I don't buy that. I don't buy e either when listeners call my show and, and you, you, you know, I have this unbelievably rare job as a talk show host, to have dialogues with people for 33 consecutive years of every conceivable background. So you hear what people think, and you, 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 how many jobs allow this? It's, I'm very fortunate. I'm, uh, it's perfect for what I want to do, is understand the world. It's like the perfect job. So, you know, people will call up and say, you know, well, Dennis, all is for the better. Everything is, everything is for the good. And I, I never bought that either. You're, uh, you're hit by a drunk driver and you're, you're brain damaged. It's, it's for the good. What good is it for? It's not for the good. It's just bad. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I've never camouflaged suffering and evil. They're very real. I'm not a Buddhist, and I, 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 by the way, I have great respect. Buddhism influenced me tremendously in not having expectations in life. It did. It did. It's, it's, just, it's in my book on happiness. It's a very major feature of my, of my existence. It's why I'm so grateful, because I have no expectations, so everything's a present. So I look at it every single day. But uh, I, I, I just... Uh, I don't accept the notion that everything is for the good. 
there's real bad that really happens, there's really unjust suffering that people undergo, and there's real bad in the world. It's, de it's desirable not to confront it, because people rather have a good time. Because <laughs> fun beats fighting evil. I understand that. So, what are the, uh, there are two things we have to do. Clarify the problem and then are there solutions? That is part of the title that Dave Gordon gave me. So let's talk first. Remember, again, let me give another analogy. You can't get better if the doctor doesn't know what your disease is. So we have to talk about the disease, and then we can talk, is there any hope? If you, if you have third stage cancer, we, you better well know you have third stage cancer. And yes, there is hope, but it remains third stage cancer. Okay, so what's, what are some of the big problems confronting us as humans generally and as Jews specifically? In no order of importance, because they're all extremely important, Islam. Uh, and yes, I'm saying Islam, I'm not just saying radical jihadists. Islam is a moral problem in the world. That doesn't mean all Muslims are. There are righteous, beautiful Muslims. There are disgusting Jews, disgusting Christians, disgusting atheists. Everybody knows that. There are wonderful Muslims. And no one who says, oh, no one, well, I can't say no one. Any, anyone who says that Islam is a moral challenge to humanity right now, is not saying all Muslims are. Do you know who said what I just said? The extremely religious Muslim president of Egypt. He said this, he says this over and over. Islam is a problem. It must be reformed. The world isn't, I'm paraphrasing him, the world is not cuckoo for thinking that we love death. This idiocy of, oh, only a tiny fraction of Muslims are jihadists. First of all, did, did, did they not read polls? The Pew Research Center takes these international polls about how people think, you know, the great majority of Egyptians, of Egyptians, believe that if a Muslim who converts to another religion should be killed. I think it's 80% of Egyptians. And, and these, these data on supporting terror are high in very many Muslim countries. Supporting blasphemy laws. If you insult Muhammad, you should die. If you insult Islam, you should die. If you convert from Islam, you should die. These are widely, widely believed. And then you learn in academia, and, and academia is actually in my list of great problems confronting humanity. You learn in academia that of all the fundamentalists of all religions are a problem. Really? How many of you really worry about fundamentalist Mormons? <laughs> uh, you never know when you're going to get blown up by a Mormon. <laughs> See a guy reading the Book of Mormon and a tie and jacket. <laughs> That's a worry. I mean, what, what kind of lie is that fundamentalist of all religions? Or, or, the, or, you know, the, the unbelievable reaction of hatred against this woman who had the conference on to make cartoons of Muhammad. How come they were, why did the New York Times editorialize against the hit Broadway show, The Book of Mormon, where for two hours people mock the, the holy work of the Mormon church and Mormons generally? Did anybody go to, the, would they put out the Book of the Quran? These cowards on Broadway, the cowards in Hollywood, no one's just as cowardly as Hollywood. That's not true, the college uh, deans are, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a competition. And, 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 and so, do you know about the Book of Mormon? Are you familiar with how popular that show is? It played here too, exactly. It played, it's played all over North America. And it mocks, it mocks people's religion. And so you know what the Mormons did? 
to the best of my knowledge, they did not shoot up any theater that showed it. I'm glad you're laughing, because it is, it's laughable. What they did was, they took an ad out in Playbill uh, in, on Broadway, said, now that you've seen the show, read the book. <laughs> it's a brilliant, brilliant reaction. But can you imagine a show mocking the Quran for two hours? You would have to have armed guards surrounding the place. People would have to walk in with their faces covered lest they be followed home and killed. But hey, there's no problem emanating from Islam. No, no, really? What, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Tens of thousands of Muslims growing up in England, born in England and in France and in Germany, going to fight with people who, whose only appeal is that they burn people alive and gang rape little girls. That's the, that, there's, there is, believe it or not, you never thought, how can you get, in some ways, it's only some ways, obviously, in some ways, they found on the Nazis. The Nazis hid their crimes. The Islamists are proud of them. They put them on YouTube. The Nazis would not have put gas chambers on YouTube. They did everything they could to hide it from people. Think of that. Think of that. And, and why do they do it? To instill terror in people that they'll conquer and to get people to join them. Come join us. You too can burn people. You too can cut the throats of Egyptian Christians. You too can rape little girls. This is the group. That's what we stand for. That's what they stand for. But hey, no problem in Islam. That has nothing to do with it. Islam has never been a religion of peace. It's a lie that George W. Bush came out with. Maybe he had to because he didn't want to, to create tension within Islam. It's not a religion of peace. That doesn't mean all Muslims are warlike. It doesn't mean all Muslims are anything. But it's not. It started out as a warlike religion. How did, how did in one generation Islam go from a tiny sect on the Arabian Peninsula to, to conquering all of North Africa by persuading them of the, of the greatness of the Quran? It was by conquering. It is estimated that 80 million Hindus were killed in the thousand year rule of Islam in India. 80 million. It is considered in the, in the story of civilization by uh, Ariel Durand Will and Ariel Durant, uh, to be the greatest uh, single destruction of people in the history of the world. But they don't teach it in India because they don't want to inflame passions between Muslims and Hindus. The greatest Arab writer who ever lived, Ibn Khaldun, uh, in the Middle Ages, wrote the Mukaddima, the introduction to history, and in it he wrote, that we are a much greater religion than Judaism and Christianity because only we kill in the name of our God. We will kill people who do not convert, they won't. That's the greatest Arab writer who ever lived. You can't say anything that I have just said, anything. It cannot be said in any university in the United States of America. I don't know the steps of the story in Canada. I suspect it is quite similar. You can't say it. It's not meant with hatred. It is not meant to instill hatred. It does not have anything to do with bigotry. Nothing, nothing. It's only truth that needs to be understood. I have Muslims on my show regularly, Muslims, believing Muslims, who believe that Islam needs to be reformed. And I'll tell you the simplest reform, very simple, that they drop the ideal of a Sharia-based state. If you want to observe Sharia, very much what orthodoxy did in Judaism, the ideal was, at, in, the, in Torah times, of having a, a state that was, was halakhically based. And so, uh, you know, the Mekoshe Shetzim, the man who uh, was, uh, was, uh, because they should see many gathering. gathering. We're gathering the trees, gathering wood on, on Shabbat publicly. God, Moses asked God, what should I do? He said, put him to death. But by the way, I have, 
I'm writing a commentary on the Torah will be on my, my life's project. I, it's already or orally given on about 200 CDs. I did it verse by verse the Torah over 20 years. I defend the Torah on this, by the way. The first generation outside of Egypt, God's trying to make ethical monotheism, and a guy publicly violates one, publicly violates one of the Ten Commandments. What is God going to say? You know, give him a fine? I, I, told, I, 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 I understand that. But uh, long ago, we have abandoned the idea that the state must enforce halakha. The Orthodox Jew observes halakha. He would like to persuade you to observe halakha. That's fine. If a Muslim wishes to persuade people to observe the Sharia, I have no, no issue with that. But their dream is to impose it, not just impose it on Muslims, impose it on non-Muslims, which, by the way, never existed in Judaism. You know? and, and, and to the extent it ever existed, it would be in one place, in Israel. So Islam is an issue. Related to that is the hatred of Israel. I spoke today, on my, just today on my show, uh, from memory, you should all know about memory, Middle East Media Research Institute, uh, based in Israel, I believe. Well, maybe it's based in the US, based in both, I think. They actually just show Islamic, Arab, and especially Palestinian television. I mean, they don't make up anything. Here's the raw footage, and here is the subtitle in English. They showed from June 1st, 2015, a graduation, a kindergarten graduation, five-year-old Palestinian kids, all dressed in army fatigues with gigantic guns, marching in step and chanting and singing how they will, uh, they will uh, gouge the eyes out of Jews and uh, cut the hands off of Jews, and will, they, they came here alive, but they will leave dead. This was the essence of the song. Fifth grade, a fifth, a fifth five year old kindergarten graduation. But uh, I debated, I debated the head of the Center for Jewish Studies at UCLA about 10 years ago. You know what the subject was? Are the Israelis and Palestinians morally equivalent societies? The head of Jewish studies at UCLA said yes, I said no. Head of Jewish studies at UCLA. The head of Jewish studies at UCLA, his successor, just invited Cornell West to give the keynote lecture on Abraham Joshua Heschel. Cornell West has compared Gaza to a Nazi concentration camp and, and is a pro-BDS. He supports the economic strangulation of Israel and the Center for Jewish Studies at UCLA just invited him to give a keynote speech. You can read my article on it on the internet. Anyway, uh, Israel hatred is huge in this world. There is no other reason, there's no possible rational reason why Israel is so isolated in the world other than it's a Jewish state. There's no other possible reason. I debated at, at Oxford, the most prestigious forum of debate in the world, the Oxford Union, last November. Shmuley Bartas and I were the two debaters, and uh, the other team had two. One of them was an Israeli, who's now an Israeli expatriate, Avi Shlain, professor of international relations at Oxford, and a PhD student from Berkeley. PhD. She is a PhD from Berkeley. You know what she said? And you can see this again, it's on YouTube. Go to Oxford Debate, Dennis Prager, or any of the names of those of us who debated. She said, Israel is doing to the Palestinians what the, what the Nazis did to the Jews. About 400 Oxford students there, and they won the debate. And I'm a good debater. It wouldn't matter. I think, I think we made it closer than it would be normally, but it doesn't matter. It should have been, they should have gotten zero votes. At Oxford University, most prestigious university on this planet, you can say that Israel is doing to Palestinians what the Nazis did to the Jews and win? And not be booed off the stage for lying, for calumny, for libel? It's unbelievable. The libels against Israel are like the blood libels against the Jewish people in Europe.
Europe that we tell Christian children to use their blood to make matzah. It's at that level that Israel is doing to the Palestinians what the Nazis did to the Jews. Or that Israel uh, committed genocide, commits genocide. Another big libel, very popular in Europe. It's unbelievable to watch what is happening, that you can't walk in most of France today with a yellow or a Jewish star, 70 years after Auschwitz. Isn't it ironic? 70 years ago, you had to walk with a star, and now you're not allowed to walk with a star. It's unbelievable. So this, it's, it, this Israel hatred, which is Jew hatred in a, in a different form, is another bad sign. Next, the decline of the West. The West began its decline, the freest, most enlightened part of the planet. Okay, the planet stinks. You know my old line? Oh, well, you may not. My old line is, humanity stinks, but I love humans. And that's how I feel. I love individuals tremendously. But humanity is unimpressive. Uh, my inexhaustible yearning to understand evil, I am now reading a major history of slavery. I mean, what, 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 what Africans endured on those ships, it's very rare I use a, a, a Nazi parallel. It, it was Nazi-like, the conditions for blacks on the ships from Africa. I mean, it's still better to be a slave than to be gassed. That's why they were African American, right? Because they weren't exterminated. But the conditions of the trip were not black. How do people do this? Just how do people do these things? The mass amount of rape and torture and, and murder in human history is, is just tremendous. Anyway, there was a place where, which also had bad stuff, but was better than the rest. It was the West. The West was better than the rest. It, it had representative government before the rest did. It had hu human rights before the rest did. It had female rights before the rest did. And what happened? World War I in Europe knocked out the West's belief that it had better values. If we had better values, we wouldn't have had the slaughterhouse called World War I. So people stopped believing in two huge things. Nationalism, because they believe nationalism caused World War I, and Christianity. So no more Goth and no more nationalism in Europe. It died at the end of World War I. In the United States, Vietnam served to be America's World War I as it was to Europe. No more belief in America after Vietnam. Which is mind-boggling, because I still don't know. To this day, I don't know what we did wrong, we Americans in Vietnam. I know so many of you will disagree, but if you believe that was wrong to fight for the liberty of South Vietnam, then it was wrong to fight for the liberty of South Korea. But you never hear anybody say that. Korean War, 37,000 Americans died. And Canadians died, I might add, to preserve the freedom of, of, of at least half of the Korean people. And now, I use a Samsung phone and, and, and drive a, and a South Korean car. It's one of the most modern places, free places, affluent places on Earth. And North Korea is a dungeon. It is the largest dungeon in human history. It's called North Korea. And you know why? Because American troops aren't there. American troops are in Germany, Japan, and South Korea. They're lucky. American troops left South Vietnam. They weren't lucky. We got boat people. American troops left Iraq. They're not lucky. They got the Islamic State. But the enlightened think that if America fights, it's for oil. What do we fight for in Korea? Kimchi? <laughs> not all of you know what kimchi is, so let me just tell you. I ate kimchi at the Seoul airport 34 years ago, and I still taste it. <laughs> it is the only permanent food ever made in the world. It is a, it, it is the decline of the West, 
that we don't believe in ourselves. We're religion free. I will talk about secularism because it's another disaster for the world. And of course, instead of lack of belief in itself, what we now believe in is multiculturalism. Multiculturalism. So it's a very interesting, what does multiculturalism mean? It means you celebrate all cultures because all cultures are equal. But all cultures aren't equal. I mean, no, no, nobody, nobody really believes all cultures are equal. Do you believe that a culture that engages in female genital mutilation is equal to a culture that doesn't? I'm just curious. Does anybody, does the biggest advocate in Ontario known for multiculturalism, you're greeted at the airport with welcome in 14 languages, not Hebrew, incidentally. Fascinating. I find that just fascinating. I, I, as I told the, the people I met with earlier, my suspicion is there are more Jews, there are more Hebrew speakers in, uh, in, uh, in Ontario or Toronto than Thai speakers. That's my suspicion. But there's no Hebrew up there because a lot of people would object. What is it? There's an old saying, the warmest of hearts, there's a cold spot for the Jews. <laughs> Multiculturalism is nonsense. You celebrate every human, but you don't celebrate every culture. I don't celebrate every culture. Aztec culture is morally inferior to Judeo-Christian culture. I am prepared to say something that is so obvious that it is only in a sick world that it is controversial to make such a statement. A society that does not have human sacrifice is preferable to a society that does have human sacrifice. Is that a big leap? <laughs> but multiculturalism comes from the belief that your culture isn't any better. It's like the head of Jewish studies at UCLA. Israel's no better than the Palestinians. It's perfect. This man's a multiculturalist. That's multiculturalism par excellence, isn't it? And then there is the belief, therefore, that there is no good reason for Western countries to be powerful. And you have a tremendous pacifist strain in the West. But I remind people all the time, the Nazi concentration camps, the death camps, were not liberated by peace activists. They were liberated by soldiers, by killers, by people paid to kill. Because if nobody killed the Nazis, you'd all be dead. No, most of you wouldn't be here. Your ancestors would have been dead, hence you wouldn't be here. It's mind-boggling, the upside down, the broken moral compass. That's what, that's what is worrying to me, the broken moral compass. That we believe that peace activists do anything good the best way to get the world rid of evil is to kill the people doing it. There is no other solution to Islamists, radical Islamists, to Nazis, to, to the, and the communist genocidal horrors from Mao to Pol Pot to Stalin. Stop them with peace activists. You know when the Mashiach will come? when the uh, U.S. military gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Because <laughs> it deserves it. And then there is uh, the belief uh, that uh, Europe so bought the idea of multiculturalism that it was nothing for them to bring in tens of millions of Muslims from Pakistan and from the Middle East. Why not? All cultures are equal. But they're, well, even if they're equal, they're certainly not the same. The values of some of these Muslims are truly Western liberal values. But the values of many of these Muslims are antithetical to Western liberal values. So you have a fairly large pocket of people within Europe who don't believe in Europe. But fools, fools who believe in multiculturalism said it's a non-issue. And you know why they bought in so many people? Not just because they believe in multiculturalism, because they don't reproduce. Germany is disappearing. Russia 
is disappearing. Italy is disappearing. Spain is disappearing. At the rates they're going, they will have tens of millions fewer people in 40 years than they do today. And then that accelerates. And remember, not only that, the vast majority of people that do exist will be old. So you cannot have a welfare state. The welfare state will implode. It can only work if you have about six workers for every retired person. But the ratio will, is now one to one, and soon will be more retired people to every worker. It cannot exist. So they will have to import more people who don't share their values into Germany and into Italy and so on to survive as a state that they now have. What happens when you don't believe in yourself? Who has kids? They say affluence is, is what causes people not to have children. There's some truth to it, but there's an infinitely bigger truth that you'll never learn at York, or the University of Toronto, or at Harvard, or at UCLA, and that is secularism. Secularism tells people not to have children, not affluence. Who has children? Let me ask you a question. If you had to bet serious money, and you met a family, a Canadian family, with eight children and the same parents. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Just add that for argument's sake. Eight children of the same parents. Not necessarily named Karabkin. Just what you don't know their name. Is it eight or nine? It was nine? Ten? Very good. Nine to what? I remember that. I knew uh, so let me ask you, would, how many of you, if told, would you bet, you have to bet 50,000 hard-earned dollars that the family is either deeply religious or deeply secular? Is there one person in Ontario? Is there one professor who would bet it's a, a secular family? If there is a secular family with eight children, only two possibilities occur to me off the top of my head. One is they weren't secular when they had the children, and they became secular after, or it was just a series of mistakes. For whatever reason, it just the usual barriers didn't work. There's no other possibility. Secular people don't have eight children. If, they, if people have eight children in Canada or the United States, it's because they are either Orthodox Jews or Mormons or traditional Catholics or evangelical Christians. Correct? Correct. Or for that matter, some Muslims. That's it. That's it. Secularism says to you, live now because there is nothing else and children are a burden. That's a fact. That's a fact. All responsibility is a burden. That's why people aren't getting married in secular society. That's why my next problem is secularism. That's the biggest part of the decline of the West and its broken moral compass. Because secularism doesn't have a moral compass. That's not to say secular people are bad. There are many wonderful secular people and many despicable religious people. Secularism, though, doesn't have a moral compass. It can't. If there is no God, murder isn't wrong. You can have the opinion that murder is wrong, but it's just an opinion. In the New York Times, the, 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 the lover of secular society, there was an article a few months ago by a professor, a secular professor, lamenting the fact that American young people do not believe that there are any moral truths. There is no moral truth. There is only opinion, including murder. What I have been saying for 40 years and been dismissed by secular people so often. Oh, you know what Prager says? Uh, if you don't believe in God, you don't think murder is wrong. I never said that. I know you can think murder is wrong. I said if there is no God, murder isn't wrong. I didn't say you can't think it's wrong. But that's all you can do is think it's wrong. Other people think it's right. And if there's nothing higher than you and them, it isn't wrong. It's just an opinion. That's what secularism has bred. So we, that's why there's so little marriage. That's why there are so few children. That's why there are no moral truths. 
That's why people don't fight evil. Why fight? They don't even know what to do. Well, let them do what they want. It's, it's not our business. It's a real problem in the secular world. Secular government is great. Secular society is awful. And it does another thing. It deprives people of a cause, of a belief that they live for something beyond just this life. That's why Marx hated religion. This was my field of study at Columbia, was, was Marxism and, and communism. Why did Marx hate religion? Because religious people didn't make revolutions. That's why he called religion an opiate. Because instead of making religion, poor people were happy because they had a church. They had God. So he hated religion because nobody made religion, or nobody made revolutions if they were religious. So now we don't have religion, and everybody's making revolutions. Everything is thrown over. Everything is thrown over regularly. People need some cause, or life is baseless. The, 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 the passion that people give to their causes, whether it's the rape culture on, on American campuses. Do you have a rape culture on Canadian yeah, campuses, no. too? Is, it, yeah, is that? Yeah. That's, it's, it's coming? No, well, no, it's, it's here. It's here. All right, just remember, we're your future. Okay? If you ever want to know the Canadian future, look south, young man. <laughs> Unfortunately. This is the big thing now in America, that colleges are a rape culture, a rape culture. We're told that one out of four women are going to be sexually assaulted, which is the new term because, by the way, if you look at the definition, it's fascinating. You know what sexual assault includes? An unwanted kiss. Now, I have to say, an unwanted kiss is crude, rude, boorish. But I wouldn't put it up there under rape or sexual assault, but it is. So, one, by the way, if that's the case, I'm shocked it's only one in four. I mean, I think a lot of women here can say that at some time in their life they got an unwanted kiss, perhaps even from their husband. I doubt it. Just, just, just thinking aloud. By the way, you don't know, I said this in Florida, in Sarasota, Florida, just uh, a few, uh, about six months ago, and I was vilified, and you can, you can see it's all on YouTube. Uh, vilified by big left-wing sites that I was making fun of marital rape. So that, that a little hysterical. A little, I would think so. My wife thought it was a little hysterical, just for the record. <laughs> so they, when you don't have religion, you find other causes. And so we get all of these causes that people are in that uh, that substitute for religion, but they give people the same degree of passion. <coughs> then there's academia, and then I have one more thing to say and I'm finished. Academia, which is the, the secular temple, that's, you know, the Jewish temple is the synagogue, Christian temple is the church, Muslim temple is the mosque, and the secular temple is the university. And that's where all of these things cohere most. Children in the United States are sent to places that teach them the opposite of the values that many of their parents have. And they pay a lot of money and go into a lot of debt to do so. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I actually have this woman, oh, awesome, it's a Canadian example. She went to McGill. How do you like that? What a coincidence. And you can see, right, Prager and McGill student and uh, heterosexual, just Google it, it's fascinating. Actually, it's in my book. I don't know if it's on, if that book is available here. But I know it's available in Canada, but I don't know if it's available tonight. Still the Best Hope, my previous book, on Islamism, Americanism, and Americanism would totally apply to you, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, leftism. It's really three books in one. Anyway, a girl called me up. No, 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 excuse me, she didn't call me up. I read an article sent to me by a, a female, about a female student at McGill who, who wrote the following article. She entered McGill, and all she was interested in, term, in, in sexual terms were, 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 were boys, men, males. But she learned at McGill that that is heterosexist, that that's bigotry um, in favor of heterosexuality. 
and she doesn't want to be a bigot. So she started to have sexual liaisons with females. And she now has, she's now bisexual because college taught her not to think in those terms. By the way, I played for my audience yesterday and today Jerry Seinfeld saying the following. My, my wife mentioned to our daughter that now she's 14, soon she's going to want to go to uh, the city or whatever it was and she to meet boys. And she looked at her mother and said, that's sexist. It's sexist to say to your daughter, you may want to go here because you can meet guys. It's sexist. I'm surprised she didn't say heterosexist. Because that's what, that's a, but the, it's too many syllables when you're 14. But that's what she learned. It, it, is, it is, by the way, it is heterosexist. It is. Judaism is heterosexist. It prefers that people bond with the opposite sex. That is correct. It is heterosexist. I agree. And that's what they're learning. So if you really want to be open, you are a bigot if you confine your sexual activity to only your sex. You could read the dialogue I had with the girl uh, in, in my book, and it's, I'm sure it's on the, uh, you can hear it on, on, the, on the internet. That's academia in a nutshell. Academia in a nutshell is the place where the BDS movement is strongest. Strangle Israel because it's such a bad place. Yep. You know, there are times on my show people will say something so stupid that I will say the following. And I have rather bright listeners, but they will, even the bright listener might say, bright people can make stupid comments. So they will say something particularly stupid, and then I will say to them, I'm just curious, uh, what graduate school did you attend? And they will say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Why do you ask? I said, because you could only have made a statement that stupid if you went to graduate school. <laughs> Why would I believe that? And then there was no, it's funny sounding, but I believe it. I believe it. The idea that men and women are basically the same came from graduate schools. So much so that the president of Harvard tells the following story. He believed it. He believed that the president of Harvard, but to his great credit, Larry Summers, is in the Obama administration and president of Harvard, major economist. So I believe that I believe boys and girls are basically the same. You give girls train sets, trunks, and you give boys dolls and tea sets. So I gave my daughter one holiday, I gave my daughter trucks. And then guess what happened? Because I didn't want to give her a sexist upbringing. So I hear nothing coming from her room. I knock on the door. Says everything okay, and she greets me. Shh, I put them to bed. <laughs> That's not my story. That is the president of Harvard, a good liberal story. She gave them names, put them to bed. Other callers then called me. They said they did the same thing. They gave their daughter trucks. So one had a big truck, and inside it had little trucks. And the big truck was mommy truck, and the little trucks were baby trucks. Is there a boy in the history of Earth? On, in any of 212 countries that has ever done that with a truck? No, the answer is no. Look, Dad, Daddy truck, mommy truck, and baby trucks. Even, and I'm not mocking him, even Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, did not do that. <laughs> so, in, I, in order to believe Israel is an apartheid state, you had to go to college. You had to go to college. In order to believe men and women basically say you had to go to college. In order to believe that the United States and the Soviet Union were legally responsible for the Cold War, you had to go to college. Or graduate school, in my case, School of International Affairs at Columbia, that's what I was taught. U.S. and Soviet Union equally responsible for the Cold War. Just two big powers struggling it out. So what's the solution? The solution is simple. The solution is to undo all of these damage. And we begin with a God-centered Weltanschauung, a God-centered worldview. 
If you want to call it Judeo-Christian, then I have no problems in calling it that. That is what that is what it is. And here I will just speak now. I spoke as in general. I will now speak my last minute specifically as a Jew to mostly Jews or all Jews. We have failed our mission on earth. Our mission on earth is to bring the world to the God of the Ten Commandments. It's one of my most recent book is on the Ten Commandments. That is, that's our task, to, to bring the world to Sinai, to put it in poetic terms. You know why we're hated? The rabbis had a great answer, genius answer. They, they said it in, in, one, uh, in one sentence with a play on Hebrew words. You know, how do you say hatred in Hebrew? Sinai. How do you say Sinai in Hebrew? Sinai. Do they sound the same? They sound virtually identical. Yes, one is a sin and one is a psalm, but it doesn't matter. They sound virtually identical. The great hatred comes from Sinai. The Sina of the Jews comes from Sinai. And they're right. Jews took a God, took an idea that the world hated. Hello, there's a God for everybody who judges you all and he demands that you not do the following things. We're not, that is the, so the, the source of Jew hatred is the solution to Jew hatred. Have the world obey the Ten Commandments. That's it. That's all we have to do. But Jews still have, religious Jews have no sense of mission to mankind. I am often criticized by religious Jews. And I praised them in the beginning, but I only tell what I believe to be the truth. Religious Jews will often say to me, Dennis, we have too big a problem keeping Jews Jewish. We're going to go to non-Jews? Well, then the answer is we'll never go to non-Jews because we'll always have a problem keeping Jews Jewish. We've had a problem keeping Jews Jewish since we got out of Egypt. So then, then, then there is no task. We have no task to the world. God chose us. I totally believe we're the chosen people. There's no other explanation. For, for Jewish survival, Jewish success, and, Jew, and hatred of Jews. There is no other explanation. Of all the countries in the world, Israel's being isolated. It has to come from a divine origin. So, but we, we do nothing. We are a messenger who forgot his message. Except for secular Jews, many of whom are the leading messengers, the heads of feminism, the heads of socialism, the heads of Marxism, the heads of environmentalism. It reads like a B'nai B'rith roster. <laughs> right? Is that not true? From Betty Friedan and feminism to Karl Marx, grandson of two Orthodox rabbis in, in, in Marxism, it, it's, it's endless. Because when Jews leave Judaism, they don't stop being religious. They just develop other religions. And meanwhile, we're, we're so preoccupied with, uh, with our own community, with our own little, little shtetl of observant Jews, that we don't go out into the world. Just imagine for a moment that every Jewish professor believed in the God of Sinai. Just imagine, would, would this tiny people, the Jewish people, not then have an enormous impact in changing all of this around? If I could make one wish, that would be it. That every Jewish professor believe in the God of Sinai. That's it. I don't care. I'm not even going to say he's going to, he's going to fast on Yom Kippur. Just believe in the God of Mount Sinai, the God who gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. That would suffice. That, for that, I would say, Diane. Because then generations of Gentiles and Jews would be taught differently, would read different books. The most widely used history of the United States in the United States is by Howard Zinn, a secular Jew whose entire book is about how awful America is. And I interviewed him before he died on my show, and I have him in my book too. I asked him, would the world have been better had there never been the United States of America? And he said yes. And he couldn't even say that World War II was justified killing. Even World War II. And he's the most widely read author of American history in the United States high schools and colleges. Imagine if this Jew had Sinai values. 
how different the influence would have been on an American generation. So yes, there is hope. Oddly enough, if Jews become Jewish, and I don't mean just in an ethnic sense, I'm not, I'm not terribly ethnically uh, interested. Obviously, Judaism is God toward Israel, so there is clearly a peoplehood component, and I feel it very deeply. But there's God and Torah, and God's first. So there's hope, and oddly enough, we are a big part of the solution if we would turn around our fellow Jews and ourselves, and of course, if non-Jews too. That's why our best friends today are evangelical Christians. It's true in the United States. It's true in Ottawa. You are the greatest prime minister. You are the greatest leader in the world today, Mike. should have cognitive dissonance. The thing Jews most trust turns out to be their biggest enemy, and the things that Jews most distrust turns out to be their best friend. Jews most trusted universities, right? To say my son and my daughter got a PhD in Cornell. <laughs> this is what Jews live for. This is my, my quick joke anecdote on that. I'm stopped a lot. By strangers, you know, like Dennis Prager, Dennis Prager. And I never know if it's a Jew or a Christian, I mean, or Jew or non Jew. But I do, there's one giveaway. If within one minute they tell me what college their kid goes to, it's a Jew. Now here's the funny, the, here's, it's the second funniest part of this story. When I tell this to Christian audiences, nobody laughs. They don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Jews do that? <laughs> they tell strangers what college they do. <laughs> like, yes, how are you? Oh, my son's a dog. <laughs> That's how they are. That's the answer to how are you. <laughs> so, here's the irony. That Jews love, and it turns out to be one of the great false gods of Jewish life, not the greatest false god of all. Seven of the 14 people who decided the Holocaust at the Vansay Conference outside of Berlin in 1941 had PhDs. Seven of the 14. And what did Jews most mistrust? Christians. Turn out they're, they're, they're our best friends. It's enough to make a Jew sick. <laughs> Universities produce our enemies. Christians are our best friends. The world is upside down. The world is not upside down. One believes in the God of the Ten Commandments, and one doesn't. It's not upside down at all. So there's hope. If we can, Thanks very, very much.